Welcome to another Forte Growth episode, where we interview people doing awesome things online. We go over their successes, insights, and any failures to keep you motivated and inspired. Sit back. Let's go. Welcome to the Forte Analytica podcast. Make sure you get with Gareth Boyd on Twitter. Get all your digital PR links and everything you need there. But today we have Jared Krause on the podcast. If you're not familiar, he specializes in buying online businesses and helping people buy online businesses and scaling them to either sell or have them as assets. So we dive into a lot of his thoughts around the current changes in the market, how that affects his processes around buying businesses. And we're not just talking just content sites. We talk through content sites. We also talk through SaaS or membership businesses as well as e-commerce. So a wide range of online businesses. And we just dive into all the different things he's looking for. So you can pick the right one to be able to scale. We also dive into a little bit around, I guess, keeping Google your business partner, quote unquote, while you're trying to build these sites and delivering good content to Google. So we dive down that road too, but uh, sit back and enjoy. All right, welcome to the Forte Growth Podcast, home of the Forte Analytica SEO agency. Make sure you hit up Gareth Boyd on Twitter, get your links, digital PR, all that done for you. But today we have Jared Krause. Welcome, Jared. Thank you, James. Good to be here. Appreciate the invite. You know, good to have you on and, and to chat again. Obviously, I hosted you, oh, it must be over a year ago now on mm. the old Niche Website Builders podcast. So it's been a while, so it's been good to, to catch up on all the different bits and pieces you're doing. But for people who aren't familiar with you, do you want to maybe give a brief background about yourself? Sure. How far back should we go? <laughs> Let's go not too far back. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so not birth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely not. Uh, so I used to be a plumber. I hated my job. I loved traveling, surfing and snowboarding. So I tried to learn to make money online. And I started a couple of businesses, sucked at it, failed, realized the 90% of startups fail. And I thought, if that's the case, why don't I go buy one? Taught myself to buy a couple of businesses that went well. And mm, people started asking me, hang on, dude, like, what do you mean you, you buy businesses and you, you own a couple and you don't need to go back home for work? People that I met on my travel. <laughs> so I created a course, taught them how to buy businesses and then turn that into a business. Now we've got a bunch of people working for us and a bunch of members in our community. Oh, I love it. I love it. The whole the whole model of buying or at least helping people get their foot in the door with buying some of these online assets because it's probably foreign to a lot of people. So I think a good place to start this podcast is around your processes around buying websites. I guess now with the current changes within Google and SEO, I mean, not all businesses are reliant on organic traffic, but I'm assuming a lot of the content businesses you're buying are somewhat reliant on that traffic. So has, have those processes changed? Are you looking at other things than, or differently than you did before? Or was the processes that you had in place before kind of accounting for the fact that you didn't want kind of that one traffic source anyway? Yeah, that's an awesome question. And the short answer is not much has changed on our end due to the systems and what I teach about buying a content site or a business is pretty evergreen. And it's not based on Google alone because Google changes and my trainings and my philosophies are evergreen, no matter how Google does fluctuate to change into like this whole AI, whatever's going to happen, search generator experience yeah. and all these different things is what I like to teach is like, yes, number one, if you do have a content site and it's got mostly traffic from Google, there's single source dependency there, of course, right? And I have things and that I teach in terms of growing businesses. So in our community, we have a big course on how to buy and then we have a course on how to grow as well once you bought it. And what I teach is like how to diversify traffic. Obviously Google traffic is like the intent is so high. It's probably the highest intent for, you know, closer to purchasing products and what people are wanting to yeah. study and learn on the internet better than most so social media sites and stuff at the moment, right? And that might change, right? It might change. Like I've heard that TikTok, you know, a lot of people using TikTok, yeah. people are using TikTok as a search engine and learning from that. So it might, it might change in the future, which is totally fine, but we still look at content as it like, as the landscape and see what competitors, when we're buying a business, we also do competitive research. We make sure we like, like, what are the competitors doing? What's ranking the best? Why? How? Is it because it's AI content or not? Doesn't matter. You know, it's mostly about value and Google, I think people really freak out about like 
Google's a Google's a funny one because people don't understand how Google works. They think that they need to play a game against Google. Whereas like if you're actually Google's business partner, which you are, why don't you partner up with them and help them win? And when you help them win, they're gonna help you win with your content site as well. And I believe people are trying to play, yeah, play these games, but also like try to guess what Google's gonna do next. Why bother with that? Because they're going to continue to change as the world evolves. And the reason they do change and understanding that is because human beings change how we consume content and that's what's going to drive the change, not Google. So understand how humans work and behave and create better content for the humans, not for like, let's think like people get too caught up in the SEO space. Like I, I have a SEO agency we launched this year as well, right? I'm big into SEO. Like, I think people get too caught up in the SEO of it, like an over-optimizing versus like, let's make something that's so awesome, even if it doesn't sit, fit into like the pattern that Google says, like, this is how we like to rank content. So to yeah, answer your no, question, like long-winded answer of like, it hasn't changed too much because we're, we're looking at content sites based on value, not like what Google says alone, because value comes before yeah. Google, I believe. Because yeah. if there's something that's more valuable, a content's going to become more valuable then and google doesn't want it with or doesn't want to rank it then people are going to not use google anymore they're going to go find out find wherever the valuable content is that's more valuable than what google's ranking so it doesn't really matter google's doesn't matter in that aspect and that's why people are freak out freak out because they don't understand that like value trumps google nice nice there's a few things i wanted to unpack in that little rant, rant you went on there a good one too <laughs> around and uh, it's good that it's perfect when guests go on these little rambles. Yeah. It means that I get questions out of its ass back. But you mentioned about, you know, if it's human written or AI content, it doesn't really matter. Do you want to maybe unpack that a little bit for the listeners? Yeah, well, where to start? That's a big question. A lot <laughs> in that. I don't like talking about AI too much because I think it adds to the fear loop of, because people are scared of what they don't understand, right? And that's why people are scared because they don't understand it. Now, with this whole AI content thing, it does it like Google has said what they're going to rank is it doesn't matter if it's AI written or not, right? And I think that's mm -hmm. good because I would consume content that's written by AI if it's like absolutely out of this world amazing, right? If it was better written than a human mm -hmm. being, I think don't think it really matters. But the reality is that, and I heard this on a podcast the other day, is that like, is AI going to take over humans? And... The answer, like they say, I think they were channeling, like channeling something. And uh, the answer was that, like, no, because AI can't love. And I was like, whoa, hang on. So, because AI can't love, right? AI is very like mm -hmm. analytical, logical, but the content that we like to consume is content that we love and to get content that we love normally a bit of love needs to go into it right and love is mm -hmm. typically art right is beauty and yep. ai doesn't have that like human beings do right it doesn't have those nuances that we can put into our content and that's why i believe like it's you know it should always be you know, quality assured by a human being if it's going to go out for human beings. Like if it's just AI just for humans, like eventually, you know, it, it could get really good. But yeah, I, I guess we're going down the rabbit hole there. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. So does that mean, obviously you mentioned like content made with love, I guess you could say as, as the human version of uh, something that someone's passionate about. So yeah. When you're advising someone on buying a business, it could be a beginner, it could be someone who's maybe more well-versed. Uh, how are you helping them decide between something that maybe they see a site that has lots of low-hanging fruits and a niche they can make a lot of money they don't quite care too much about versus a site maybe they're passionate about, but maybe there's not as much low-hanging fruit on there for them to take on, but it's still something they can still build. Is there is there a, a path you tend to stare people down regarding that? Yeah. We've all been conditioned in certain ways since birth, right? Societal conditioning and then conditioning through media, depending what you like to consume, YouTube, podcast, TV, whatever it is, right? And then we have built these certain belief systems around it. And one of those belief systems that a lot of people have is that your passion is your pension, 
and you need to follow your passion and they believe that you need to follow your passion in work and I don't have that belief system, right? I believe you can be passionate about everything. Just because you don't like the whole thing doesn't matter, right? They still believe you can be passionate about a certain aspect of your work. For example, when I was plumbing, I mm. hated my job as a plumber. As a whole, I just absolutely hated it. And when I left, just before I left, like six months before I left, six months to a year before I left, I started to appreciate the job for what it was. And then I started to learn about what I liked, what parts of plumbing and my job that I actually liked and what parts I didn't. And I lent more into doing more of the parts that I liked and did less of what I didn't like. And I ended up liking my job mm. more and more and more, right? So I found passion within a job that I hated, which is, which is wild to think. Now, when we, <laughs> when we buy a business, that buying something that's in a, that you're passionate about can be a double-edged sword. Number one, it can help you drive that business in a way that you're passionate about, right? Which can help you get good results. The other side of that is that if you're passionate about something and the business doesn't do so well, you may drive this business for longer than you should be doing. And it might be running at a loss and you might be trying to dig this thing out of a hole, right? Get this thing out of a hole because you're so <laughs> passionate about it. Maybe your identity is wrapped up in it a little bit and you, you know, it just becomes a dangerous thing. So I believe there's a difference between somebody that should start a business and somebody that should buy a business. If your goal is to just make money online, do not start a business, in my opinion, right? Because your only goal is yeah. to make money. Now, if your goal is to make money and you start a business, because 90% of startups fail, facts, right? And there's so many studies done on this. Typically, when you start something to make money, you're going to want to try and make money as soon as possible, right? And typically, mm. we will not spend as much money or resources or cut corners to try and get the money as fast as possible. And then you're going to end up creating a business and a product or service is not like the best because people just know that like you're just doing this for the money. So if that was you and you just want to make money, want to buy something that's a system, that's what a business is, is a system that produces a result for people and you get paid an income for it or you make a profit for it. Why not just buy a system that's already doing that and run it and then maybe hire some people to help you grow it or do a little bit of growth yourself if you like and then you're going to make money, right? So why not just get something that's already doing it? Now, I know I'm a little bit biased towards that as well. So take that with a grain of salt if you guys like. <laughs> and then the, when it comes to starting a business, I believe the only people that should start a business is somebody that has something that they're so damn passionate about at the same time that product or service does not yet exist. And they have to get mm. that out into the world because it's eating them up. And... Because they've got that passion and that product or service doesn't yet exist in the world, they're going to be the ones that are going to do the five to 10 years minimum trying to make that business work. And they're playing the long game, which means they're not going to try to cut corners on the product because they're passionate about it. They're not going to try to cut corners on the service. They're not going to try to cut corners on the value. They're the people that I believe should start businesses versus if you just want to make money online, why not just invest, you know? Yeah, exactly. Or the way Google's going, you can just spam your parasites and everything else and, and probably start ranking number one with, with some money invested there. Well, obviously, you don't own your own property, but hey, it's, it's a way to make money online, right? Yeah. I mean, how, you know, if you were to start, at, like, I'm not an advocate for starting website businesses, but if you were, I mean, take 30 grand, create the six, you know, maybe you put, you know, six, six, amazing pieces of content out there, link building and all that sort of stuff and, or 10, right? Maybe not like thousands, like everybody's doing. You know? I like to zig where everybody <laughs> else zags and they create some amazing content that's so damn good. That's better than anything else on the internet, build some authority towards it. And you can, you can crush it by like, not just trying to go super thin with too much, too many articles. Mm. You know, I get the, under, I get there's an equation of like ranking and topical authority and stuff like that. But yeah, I'm, I'm an advocate for like less content, better, spend more money on it. Spend a couple of grand on one article, like you'll crush it. Wow. Have you spent a couple of grand on one article before? Well, I don't really do much content creation in terms of articles. Like I'm the, yeah. I'm the YouTube and the podcast guy. We are putting out content as well at the moment in terms of blog content. And I haven't spent a thousand dollars on one article. I have put together some pretty large sort of strategies that tens of thousands of dollars. 
content strategies. Damn. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you can you can you can spend some good money on content depending on what you're trying to do there. But yeah. you mentioned at the beginning as well around around helping Google win yeah. and kind of aligning yourself as Google as almost like your business partner. I think you you kind of dove into it a little bit when you talked about creating valuable, I guess valuable content. But do you want to maybe expand on that a bit more in terms of helping Google win and what what you're trying to do when you're when you've maybe bought a site and you're looking to revamp it or you started your own business or content site and you're looking to have Google as your business partner? Yeah, I would also challenge it to like, no, let's not just help Google win, let's help before what comes before Google, like I mentioned before, is the person, the human being that's going on a journey that's coming to your site. And think about it, like put yourself in their shoes. That's the, probably the short answer is like, put yourself in the shoes of somebody who is starting the journey that comes to your website and cover every single topic with all the nuances in that topic at length and in a way that you sort of blow their mind and teach them more than they had bargained for when they actually went to your website. Now, Google's job is to find that content and rank that content higher and send more traffic to your website for that. So number one is like you're helping the human being in their journey first and foremost. And then secondly, that helps Google do, do its job as well. So you're partnering up with like multiple people here and that's what business is. It's all relationships, right? To answer the question of like, how do you do that? The short answer, like I said, put yourself in the shoes of the person that's going on that journey. So let's give you an example. So it's easy and tangible for people. I'm obsessed with surfing, right? So if I buy a site that is about surfing, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to order all the content and sort of see what has been created and then also what's working, what's not working so well. And then I'm going to sit down and think about every single stage that a surfer is going to go through. It might be the beginner phase, it might be the intermediate phase, and it might be the, the advanced phase. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to understand like every single phase of the beginner phase, right? Every single part of the journey for the beginner of like, number one, I want to learn to surf. Let's not just get like lots of thin content of like, where should I learn to surf for the best, you know, the best in, in America for the first time I'm surfing and but list a bunch of beaches that's just crappy content that nobody cares about, right? <laughs> what I would do, because I am in surfing and I'm passionate about it, and you can get the help of somebody that if you don't buy a business that's in a, in a niche that you are not in, you can get somebody that is in that niche that can come and help you build a strategy for you, right? which I think is a really good way to go. If it wasn't me that was a surfer, I'd go and sit down with a surfer and say like, for a surfer, like somebody that's going to start to surf, what sort of waves should they start learning to surf on? And that surfer is going to not do what Google and AI suggest if we prompt it even a million times. They're going to say, well, this type of wave at this type of size that breaks in this certain way is going to be the best for a beginner. They're not going to give you a location, right? So they'll say, oh, it doesn't matter where the location is. What matters is the type of wave because you need to progress from this wave then to the next type of wave, then to the next type of wave. First, you're going to start off with like surfing on white water waves. You know, somebody will push you in and then you'll start to learn how to surf the green part of the wave. Then you'll learn what the pocket is and then you'll learn, you know, the peak of the wave. Then you'll learn how to paddle. You, you'll answer all of these questions with so many nuances that people will like will read the piece of content and be like, I didn't think about that. And this is absolutely amazing. It's blown my mind that I, I was thought, oh, I'll just go and surf at this one type of beach and that's going to help me, you know, learn to surf. No, no, no. There's so much to it. And it's the same with fishing. It's the same with basketball. It's the same with every single niche. And this is like, I want to make the internet a better place. And I think Google is helping to do that. And in the land of like everybody trying to, over optimize i want people to like spend more time and effort and energy and making content better than like just how can i do this in a way that's like cheaper for me so i can just like take more money for my pockets like no no, no. The, the value you put out there you're going to get rewarded for it in the long run and that's where like people really struggle with content sites it's like let's just see what ranks let's throw everything at the wall like no do this in a really good way and like serve so I hope that answers your question on like how you would start creating content or build a strategy for yeah. each of those sites. 
for sure i love how you mentioned the nuances thing too because that i think that gets overlooked big time because people will talk about okay you're gonna have these h2 headers you have h3 faqs whatever else blah 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 but within that those nuances is what when people talk about helpful unique content that is what makes content unique mm -hmm. it's those nuances and you don't see those nuances in big publication articles or people just spitting out ai stuff it's completely missing and when you do come across an article that actually has these nuances you know that that person or at least that website brand is somewhat of an quote-unquote expert mm -hmm. in that niche yes. just from those nuances but yeah that's it's a really good way of of, of putting it yeah, they think about every single angle. Like, say you Google like how to do SEO on your website, right? And you come up, and there might be a bullet point list of like you've got you've got to do, you know, your H, you know, your H one, your H twos. You've got to have these things bullet points, and then like why they will explain like why do you need this image? Why does it need to be optimized? Why should you now put a video in your post? Why should you now put an audio? <laughs> like. Cool. Like you're just ticking and checking boxes, but this, when you're talking about SEO, what's more important is like what we've mentioned here is like, Hey, like, don't forget that SEO is driven by a human being. So when you create your content, make sure you create it in a consumable way. Like people like have at the start of the thing, like I'll teach you like boxes to check on, like in this article, you could just have at the start of the, the article you say, I'll teach you all the boxes to check but that's not going to help you help you going to grow your business. What's going to help you grow is understanding how SEO actually works and the environment of, of the internet. And if you want to learn more about that, boom, here's a link to that on how the internet and SEO actually works. And then you can link to another article that's like why you need SEO, how it actually works, how humans come first, why SEO is just not Google. <laughs> why they have SEO on every other platform and who might end up winning. TikTok might end up winning, you know, probably not Instagram because it's not super informational content, but like it, it, it could be another platform. Like for example, Google or Yahoo, I mean, so Yahoo or Bing, if Google stuff's up here, which they could, and they just go too heavily on like worrying about AI and, you know, not worrying about the human beings and value, if if Yahoo ends up ranking content that's far more valuable, I 100% can tell you that people are going to stop using Google and they're going to go where the value is. So then people mm. are like, oh, I've learned everything about how to help make Google happy. You've effed up there, right? <laughs> Learn how to make people mm -hmm. happy <laughs> oh, <for sure. laughs> and value because it can change. I mean, I know Google's been the uh, Omega for like the Alpha and the Omega for like a long time, but it can change. Like, look at, yeah. you know, so many different industries that come and go. And I, I think you obviously talked about different traffic sources there a, a bit as you refer to other search engines and social media, I guess, platforms as well. And you also talked about, obviously, when you're buying sites, you're not looking at single source dependency. But let's just say, for whatever reason, someone buys a site that's mainly Google traffic. Is there a certain platform you tend to like someone to branch out to, to diversify traffic source of the content? Or how much of that is niche dependent? Oh, that's a good question. It is pretty niche dependent. First, you need to understand your niche. And then what I like to teach, which is in my growing online business course is those people that are in that space, where do they go to consume the content and how do they consume that content? For example, mm -hmm. for myself, I do not read articles on the internet. I hate read. I hate it. <laughs> right. I will listen to an audio book. Mm -hmm. I will watch a YouTube video. I'll listen to a podcast. Right. So if I'm your target demographic and I'm about like, I'm trying to learn about surfing, I am not going to the internet to just read on like how to become a better surfer. I'm going to search for a podcast or mm. YouTube videos, right? My, my surfing coach, he's, he's absolutely awesome. I met him out in the water surfing where I used to live on the Gold Coast, my original hometown. Mm -hmm. And he has a big YouTube channel and a podcast. And he doesn't write, do like the whole Google traffic thing. He does get a lot of Google, tra I mean, YouTube traffic and stuff, but yeah, he creates content. It's super smart. I'm friends with his business partner. I also met surfing and he just gets those like, no, this is how people consume content in this space. So let's create content the way they like to consume it. 
and how and where. Mm -hmm. So if you've got like something on uh, like a, a website on say basketball, the people want to read about basketball or maybe turn that, turn those episodes, those articles into a podcast, you know, I mean, video mm. and audio is big now, like a, it's huge. huge. So yeah, you, you have to give the content to people the way they like to consume it. And it, yeah, that's how you make money. It's like you, you're building trust, yeah, through your content. I think as well, like, I don't even think you need to have a blog half the time. You can start, I mean, you mentioned you're just video yeah. and podcast, but a good friend of mine, Avi, who will be listening to this as well, shout out to you for listening anyway, but he, he we've talked about this often. He's, he talked about how when he starts another business or site, he's just going to start from mm. YouTube wow. only and branch off from there. And, and I've, I mean, there's so many examples, especially within House of Fitness. If you look at Garage Gym Reviews, they were a pure YouTube channel. Now they just dominate Google because of that. You look at um, Renaissance Periodization. They're growing like crazy on YouTube. They don't even post SEO style articles. They'll be doing millions per month just of their stuff, just from the YouTube following. And like the video is so, so much more powerful and so strong compared to that written content. It's like if, if you're going to start, you can, and, and it's usually, okay. I won't say it's always quicker, but it can be quicker on video yeah. too, right? In terms of I believe growth. so as well. The, where where like where it's hard for people starting out is a like it costs money. It costs like costs money to edit, costs time to edit. It you can get cheap content mm. through, you know, AI, you know, prompted content and written and then edited by yeah. a per like it also like writers have always been a lot cheaper than editors you know of of videos and, and podcasts mm -hmm. so that's why it's been the cheaper way to go for so long and yeah that's true i mean think about the trust levels when you're reading an article like let's just say most articles mm -hmm. are written by somebody that is not in the space you know like if in these yeah. niche in this in our ecosystem of you and me james and the people that we know are teaching people to get just, you know, have been teaching people to get a lot of volume out there because that's what the game used to be with Google of content. And, you know, you can do it cheap and let's optimize it away. It's super cheap and you can do it at max volume and you can cover topical authority and all this sort of stuff. And, yeah. you know, think about it. When you read an article from, you know, one of these sites and then you put that up against a YouTube video, who do you trust more? Somebody that's written the article that has no idea about the space and they've scrapped it together through like prompting AI versus the human being that's like, I know what I'm talking about and here I am on camera and you can actually see me. You can hold me accountable because I'm a real person in the space versus like, let's just, you know, let's just create a lot of content that somebody else can do and, and not worry about it and hopefully we make money from it. Like, yeah, it's, it, that's, what, what, that's what Google is, is pushing for is like real human beings real businesses like no no more like laptop warriors hiding behind a screen let's hold people accountable for like what they're actually doing these days you mentioned tiktok a few times have you been have you played around with tiktok at all in terms of growing i guess a social channel or even tiktok shop as you talked to uh interview james brooks on the previous episode to this one and he's crushing with tiktok shop like doing crazy affiliate marketing shit on there. I don't know if you've played around I with it. I, I've, I've posted a couple of things for buying online businesses on there and I just haven't really gone down that rabbit hole. From what I understand, like I think it's, I think it could be good for short form content. Well, it is short form content and it can get you into yeah. a, a, like longer form content, but I like, it can lead people from short form to longer form. If I think about the journey of somebody that is actually wanting to learn how to buy a business. I don't believe they're going to go to TikTok to learn how to buy a business. And also <laughs> I think their attention spans yeah. are going to be so much shorter on TikTok. And my goal isn't for people is, isn't to just get a lot of people. My goal is to just get the right people that are like, I'm willing to commit to this journey and I'm willing to listen to a full podcast episode. They listen to one and then they binge the whole thing, right? That's what most, most people do is they yeah. listen to like one or two of my podcast episodes and then they just end up binging everything and they go, oh, I can't not work with, because the trust level is built so highly <laughs> from doing so. Yeah. Versus like somebody that like might consume 15 of my TikTok videos that's a minute long. That's 15 minutes long. The trust isn't there. It's so much harder to build it. 
Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. I, I, I'm happy for somebody to prove me wrong. I believe that it will start to become a thing. Like I, it probably will take over like Instagram reels, I guess. I just can't be on social media. It's so bad for my mindset. It's so bad for like my soul <laughs> to be on social media. <laughs> it just crushes you, it takes does, you to a man, dark place. Just, yeah. If people <laughs> like for my, I, I put the energy out there. If, like people want it, they're going to find me, you know? Versus me having yeah. to go and try and find them. I'm not that desperate. And I know that people will get mm -hmm. there. Like people will get there in the long run. Typically people will like searching to Google my name or buying businesses. And then they find like the blog and then they'll find the podcast and the YouTube channel. And they're like, oh, I don't have to read stuff. I can listen or watch like we we're talking about before. Also, I do have a blog. We are starting to create content now as well. I have missed out on that whole game, but now I get to create content in a way that I believe is going to work versus like lots of thin content. I'm glad I didn't do it a long time ago because mm. I have seen other sites be smashed from it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. At, uh, on the topic of other traffic sources as well, have you, I guess, done a little dive into Facebook at all? Facebook seems to be the new trend for people trying to generate traffic from to their articles and people are seeing some pretty good reach on their various Facebook pages and growing them. Is that something that you've delved into it all not not since facebook pages used to be awesome and used to be able to get a lot of likes and a lot yeah. of traffic from it but that's cool to know it sounds like it's coming full circle I, yeah i'll have to i'll just ask that out yeah it's uh it's a fickle one because it's getting people off facebook is is the hardest <laughs> is the hardest part but on the content size too so obviously you're buying businesses is it purely content sites only or are you looking at other things SaaS tools e-commerce stores etc yeah, so I like to teach people to buy the top three main business models and I bought all of them. So number one, most beginners start with is buying a content website or a media business. I believe beginners should start there because they're a bit slower moving in terms of like paid ads, the digital marketing space of paid ads is like a lot more faster moving. Then you've got e-commerce businesses. E-commerce can be a, a bunch of different things. Like it can be drop shipping. It can be Amazon FBA. It can be your own products on your own stuff and your own brand. I teach people to buy those. And we also teach people to buy SaaS or membership businesses and grow them. Like normally we've got a really good system to help people buy the businesses. And then I'll either do one-to-one -one coaching for people that have sort of larger businesses that want to scale whether it's e-com or content or SaaS and membership, most people are going through and, and buying content websites. And then once they buy them, they, we, they basically hand over their website to our SEO agency and we grow them for them. So it's kind of like a full stack. It's a full circle. Yeah. That we can help people the whole way through some buying, growing. And then we also sell businesses to our audience as well. Then they can, you know, they want to flip, they can just basically go through the whole system and continue doing that. Or if they just want to do it for long term, they can do that too. Dude, I love that. It's like a whole little ecosystem for yourself there. Yeah. Just through buying buying the SEO agency. And we'll, we'll jump to the SEO agency too. But yeah. regarding the, I think we, we've pretty basically covered kind of what you look for when you're buying a content site. You know, not, no single source dependency. You kind of reduce the risk and valuable content, et cetera. But for the e-com side and maybe the SaaS membership side, do you want to maybe run through some quick points of, what you're looking for in buying those types of businesses versus the content businesses? Yeah, good question. It comes back to single source dependency again. Do you have one product that's selling, you know, most of the time or, your, you know, your top selling product or you have your top three selling products and what's the revenue split between those? Also single source dependency, like where's the sales coming from? Is it for Amazon FBA? Is it Facebook? Is it Instagram? Is it, you know, wherever? Uh, and then understanding that those ad algorithms and platforms can change in how they perform as well and understanding like if you're going to buy an e-commerce business is it heavily reliant on paid ads and if it is do you have experience running paid ads and can you produce the same result if not better than the previous owner or do you know so you could hire that could run those ads mm. at the same results or better than the previous owner so understanding those things obviously each business is very different in, you know, depending on like what platform they're selling with, like single source dependency of suppliers. Like if you've got a drop shipping business that has one supplier and they're like, yeah, we've been working with them for 10 years, like cool, but they could still go out of business. And then you've got all these products and how you make money um, is through those products and you can't sell them anymore. 
<laughs> so there's risks like that, but you can mitigate those risks as well. And they're also growth strategies, but I like to look at the risks because it helps me get my clients better, you know, buy those businesses for less than what they're expecting to pay and they're stoked. And then we can use that extra money to grow it. Member and SaaS and member businesses are like, what you should be looking for is what uh, also this is with e-commerce is what's your CPA, right? Cost per acquisition, how much does it cost to acquire a customer? Also with the SaaS membership, what's your CLTV, customer lifetime value, your retention rates, so you can understand how much mate you make from a customer and how much it costs you to make. So you can put that budget into like content marketing or ads as well. Also, mm -hmm. it's like there can be risks with the software, depending on what the surf software is. So understanding that. Yeah. I mean, I could go on could like along <laughs> all of these ones, but yeah. <laughs> Nice. That that single source dependency, say for e-com, have you mentioned, okay, maybe they're, they're only advertising through Facebook and they're making their revenue through there. Obviously, you, you're, you're seeing that as a risk to help negotiate the price down, but could that not be seen as a, a low-hanging fruit where you've got all the other platforms that you can still advertise on plus potentially the SEO side? Yeah, so that's a good question. Now, when you have one channel that's working really well, normally it's, you know, in terms of say the Facebook ads are working really well. When you, the way I see adding another channel is like adding another sort of mini startup to your business. It costs time and it costs money that you need to put out there to test the environment to make sure you can get those ads working. So say it's working on Facebook ads and then you decide I'm going to start running Google ads. Well, typically with Google ads, yes, I mean, it is an opportunity. Absolutely. But you also you need to understand that you may be spending money for, you know, a couple of grand or, or however much over a period of time to at least get enough data for that Google platform to understand like, this is my target audience on that platform. And this is who I should be targeting. And these are the ads that are working. These are the ads that are not working. So it's a bit of a test phase. So you're going to burn through a little bit of time, money, and resources. And cash, yeah. yeah before you get to a, like a working model of a channel that works for you, how you can sort of like speed that up. It will cost you money by using somebody that's a great digital market for the actual platform. But yes, it is a, it is a growth opportunity for sure. Absolutely. So long as you can identify that like, all right, we're selling this product on Facebook, but I know that people are going to Google and searching for it and they may not actually be finding the products. So let's advertise on Google and it can be a huge win for sure. Have you thought about adding like a, a PPC arm to your SEO agency and just be like a full, like full stack marketing service there for your clients? Yeah, I have. At the moment though, I don't have as much demand for PPC as we do yeah. for like SEO and, and content creation. When that demand gets a bit bigger. Like what I typically do now is like, I'll refer people to agencies that I know that are really good that I've either worked with, or I know that get great results and normally just like, just refer them. We don't, I don't really get any much kickback from any of those, but it's just a good thing to do. And we, if the demand gets so high, then yeah, of course we will. I mean, I'll probably just end up partnering with somebody for that side, you know, Yeah. probably the people that we're already referring to, I'll be like, Hey, let's like bring you into the you know, above the agency. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Do, do you typically like when you're hiring PPC or working with PPC to pay, say like a, a flat retainer rate or like a profit or rev share kind of deal? It really depends on the business and the business owner and what risks they're willing to take or not take. I really love pay per performance mm -hmm. and a percentage basis. I really like that, especially when you're starting out with ads, as you start to grow and scale, like say you're spending, you know, anywhere from like 30 grand or more a month on ads, you're probably going to be better off paying a retainer and paying them to just manage the ads. So having a media buyer and you having somebody help you create the media. So the content for the ads you're probably going to be making far more money versus paying like a paper performance because as you start to spend more money, you know, you, you're you still handing over that percentage of whatever the, the, you know, the sale is or the profit is to that person. And so 
maybe you become strategic about it. It was like, look, my goal is to get to like 50K in ad spend. I'm starting at 5K a month right now and I want to get the 50K. This is the e-commerce business owners or SaaS membership. And then you get to, you say, whilst we go from five to 50, I'll give you X amount of sales, right? Or I'll give you X amount of money per sale or whatever the performance fee is until we get to 50. And then let's like, how about I start paying you like 10 grand a month, you know, 120 a year to manage the ads. And then if we go from like 50 to say 250, one might change, I might change a fee and, and make a bit bigger. So it's a, so they're still going to earn more money as well, but it doesn't, you know, you both win, but you both like, they don't, you, you, obviously to do, do Dis this. Disproportionate, right? If you're just doing rib share all the Correct. way up. Yeah. Obviously you would like to pay them. Like if you, for me, I'd like to pay them so much more money up front because then they can see that if they perform, they're going to get great results. And then I can get confidence that they're going to do good work and they can get to the next level. Once they get to the next level, let's like still have you make more money. And then also I'm making more money and it's a win-win, right? Like it, it's to, to do, to do these deals though, you really want to like have a good relationship with the, with the person that you're working with. So that's why I think at the start, give them more than they probably bargain for. That's what I like to do in business is like, you know, show people that you're not just there just for the, like the quick cash grab. Like you want to work with them long term, and they're going to win from it. And if you like each other, you've got a good relationship, you make it fun and you don't have to stress or worry about them. And you're like, I'm going to give them a bunch of money. Like that's my goal for working with people is like, I want to give you all of this money. Like, let's see how we go. You know, and if they perform, they perform, they get the money. If they don't, then it's like, well, it is what it is. <laughs> you didn't perform, like, unfortunately. Yeah. And, it's, and yeah. That's, that skin in the game is so, so good too. Like, as you mentioned, if you're just paying someone 5K a month and you've scaled, I don't know, so you're, making, you're spending 30, 50, and it's like, what's the incentive for them to really put in the effort to keep scaling you when they got to find more clients, et cetera, et cetera, on top of that? Yeah, well, the incentive is that they they already know what works in your so like they already know you. They've already mm -hmm. like there's some stickiness to it. Like if you if you think about yeah. SaaS, they have some stickiness. Like those business models have some stickiness with their customers. Like there's definitely some stickiness to like it's harder to leave, and that's like the mm -hmm. in the corporate world they call that the golden handcuffs, and you just make yeah. sure that like they they could just leave at any stage that they want. It's a big risk to them to do so though, you know, mm. and it might pay off. And if it does, like you obviously want to wish them all the best. At the same time as like, just make it so good that they just want to keep working with you that they're yeah. happy to do so. They don't need to leave. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Uh, that's a perfect way to end this podcast, Jared, just to be mindful of your time. But where can people find you and follow you and uh, keep in touch with what you're doing? Sure. My name's Jared Krause. You can type that into YouTube. Google, uh, I'll type in buying online businesses. So our website is buyingonlinebusinesses.com. YouTube channel is buying online businesses. And yeah, check out the podcast. Like we've got a pretty awesome podcast. We've got some awesome guests. You came on, James. It's awesome to yep. chat to you again. YouTube channel is crushing it though. The YouTube channel, people love it. So check that out too. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, we'll link those down in the description too for anyone listening. But thanks for coming on, Jared. Appreciate it. Thanks, James. Really appreciate the invite and the chats and the questions were on point. So thank you. Awesome. Awesome.